Hey, Kim. Uh, hi, Desmond. How are uh, you? I'm great. This worked out really, really well. And uh, I think, honestly, one of the smoothest transitions ever. And there you are in your car. So this is, I'm Kim Whaley. This is Simple Politics. And I want to uh, welcome my terrific guest tonight, Desmond Mead, who has a absolutely fascinating background. We have so much to talk about. Um, but he is not only uh, the Times, uh, Times Magazine, 100 Most Influential People, helped bring 1.4 million people, uh, the franchise in Florida, but also has an absolutely fascinating personal history that, I, that I'd like to get through. So I was looking at your profile, Desmond, and I, I feel like your background sort of captures so many aspects of various experiences in American life, right? So you were born in St. Croix, moved here at age five, your parents were, you know, working class, a mechanic and a waitress. You were in the army, um, and, but, a, you know, with deep expertise around helicopters, uh, then had some drug addiction issues, uh, prison, rehab, homelessness, law school as an adult, uh, and then became a civil rights and voting rights uh, advocate and tremendously successful and a father of five. Um, I wonder... I want to walk through all of that, but I, just to ask to start, which of those, or I, maybe I didn't mention it, what are you most proud of today? <laughs> Kim, you know, that sounds like a, a bio to, uh, for a potential candidate. In front of the <laughs> office, <right? laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> no, I'm thinking about that, you know, and God, it's, it's really hard to, to pinpoint any particular thing that I'm most proud of. I would say, you know, I guess deep down inside, the fact that I've done something to improve the lives of other people, uh, to make this world a better place, uh, that's been my um, motivation for quite some time now. And, you know, I, matter of fact, I was talking to someone today, and they asked me, what do I, when I die, what do I want the world to say about me? And what I told them was, that I helped shift the narrative and shift the direction of a nation towards love, right? Towards uh, operating in an environment where there's not that much division or, or hatred or fear, you know, but rather love, you know, and, 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 and excuse me for rambling, but this is so, you asked the question, Kim, you know, I, I, matter of fact, I will use you as an example. Kim, if you're driving down the street, right? And I'm, what I'm talking about now is a space that I know that we can operate in as a, as a country, right? As a community, because I've seen it occur many times, right? After natural disasters, after catastrophes, we've seen that we do have the capacity to operate in this sphere. And one of the examples I use, Kim, is if you're driving down the street or you're on the highway and, and you see an accident ahead, and you decide to stop, you get out your car and you run up and there's someone laying on the ground, right? When you approach them, your first question is not gonna be, did you vote for Donald Trump? It's not gonna be what's your immigration status. It's not gonna be what's your sexual identity or, what, or, or how much money you make, right? Or your nationality. What's going, your question that you're gonna ask is, are you okay or how can I help, right? And it's those moments that humanity is beautiful. It's those moments that our, our community, our country is great. And I really believe in the depths of my heart that we can have more of those moments than the moments of division and hatred and fear, right? And so that's what I am most proud of, the work that I am doing to tear down the barriers and the labels that make us hate each other and fight each other because of our political differences, because of the color of our skin, you know, because of our sexual identity. When I do believe that we can coexist and we can love each other in spite of all of those differences. Well, let me ask you if you could explain, I agree with, first of all, with everything you said, and I wanna get into it in more depth because it's, it's absolutely vital. But can you explain to our viewers, when you say you brought people to love or you brought, which I agree with, you brought people into the community, 
of Americans who can participate in their democracy. Could you just explain what, what you did when, when you hear that, when people say yeah. 1.4 million, what are they talking about when they talk about Beth Desmond Mead? Listen, prior to the work that you know I led, Florida was one of four states that permanently disenfranchised anyone that had a felony conviction. So that meant that they lost the right, uh, a lot of their civil rights, all of them, uh, to include the right to vote for the rest of their lives, right? And listen, when I see a, a veteran who put his life on the line for this country, right, and come back disabled, right, and is forced to try to figure out how to put food on his table and writes a bad check for groceries, and because of that, he is told that he'll never be able to vote again, I knew that there was something wrong with that. And so what we did was we launched an effort to restore voting rights back to people with felony convictions after they've completed their sentence, right? And we're saying when the debt is paid, it's paid. Uh, you're talking about restoring voting rights to people with felony convictions. That in itself is controversial. Then you talk about doing it in a controversial state, such as Florida, which is, which is in addition to that, one of the hardest states to actually pass a ballot initiative. And then you talk about doing it at a time during a political climate that was rife with division, hatred, and fear, right? So it was a recipe for disaster. And any expert who told me that, Desmond, you must be crazy, right? And if my mother was alive, she would have asked me if I was crazy too. But I went ahead and pushed it, and we were very successful. And when we on November in 2018, we had over 5.1 million people in Florida vote yes on Amendment 4. And that was a million more people than who voted for our current governor, right? And we know that a million, at least a million of the people who voted, they were conservative, right? And so it showed the broad cross section of support. But here's the most beautiful thing, that when we looked at those 5.1 million votes, they were not votes that was based on hate. They weren't votes that was based on fear. Rather, they were votes that was based on love, forgiveness, and redemption. And we showed the world that love can, in fact, win the day and that people can connect along the lines of humanity and be driven by love to move major policy issues that impact folks without having to tear each other down. Well, we and I want to ask you, how did you do that? Because we're living in a moment uh, with an insurrection at the Capitol January 6th with hundreds of elected politicians in both at the federal and the state level. Uh, perpetuating a lie about the legitimacy of the current occupant of the, the White House, Joe Biden. Um, we have hundreds of ballot initiatives, some who, some that which have passed in Georgia, for example, uh, arbitrarily, in my mind, seeking to keep people from the ballot. And studies have shown historically those are primarily people of color or low income uh, environments. How did in this sort of what feels like a tsunami of attacks across the country, backlash against voters. How did you do this? Well, what's the secret sauce? It was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a huge difference there. What you're talking about is politically led and motivated. What we did was grassroots led, right? And th there were times when folks said, oh, Desmond, you guys have a great bipartisan campaign. I'm like, oh, heck no, we are not a bipartisan campaign. And then they would apologize and say, we apologize. We meant a nonpartisan campaign. And I said, oh, no, we're not even that. What we are is the organic grassroots movement that welcomed and enjoyed bipartisan support. And the key thing with that is that we didn't lead with the politics. We led with people, right? And so whenever you put the priorities of people above partisan politics, you can have great things happen. What we're seeing in this world is more partisan led, right? And it, it's about party priorities over the needs of the people. So how do you reach the people? And again, I haven't done the studies, but it says 60 plus percent of Republicans believe what they're being told by politicians that, that the 2020 election was stolen. How, how, when you say it's led by people, so I say to you, Desmond, I wanna make some changes. What do you do? Like, it's not step easy. Step one. What is step it's one? It's not easy. Let me tell you, this thing didn't just happen overnight, right? It took years and years of blood, sweat, and tears. 
you know, for I remember for many years, I would drive over 50,000 miles a year on my car, right, without leaving the state of Florida, right, just having conversations with folks. And one of the things that, that, that I think is a secret sauce is that I don't, I never approach folks with the politics. I approach folks with the love of it. And how did you do that, Desmond? Let me tell you how. I, the question that I asked, no matter what part of Florida I was in, it didn't matter, was a very simple question, right? And it was like, do you know anyone who you love, care about, who's ever made a mistake? That's it. It right. wasn't about the right to vote. It wasn't about Dems versus Republicans. It wasn't about black versus white, right? No, it was just a simple question. Who do you love, right, who ever made a mistake? And what do you want to happen to them? Yeah, so you right? connect to them human being to human being and yeah. common core values rather yeah. than around a team mentality. There you go. There you go. Um, so just so again, so our viewers understand this, what's the traditional rationale for not allowing people who have the mis have a mistake in their past that wound the, up a felony conviction, the, they, they pay, they serve their the, sentence, they pay their fines or whatever. We can talk about that. They serve their sentence and we're going to take away your ability to, to actually vote for, for your elected leaders as well. What's the rationale? Let me tell you, I, I've searched far and wide, high and low for that rationale. And I can tell you this, the only ones that make any kind of sense are the ones that are based on partisan politics, right? And even then, right, it's a very weak argument. At so explain end, what you mean by that. Oh, well, you know, what you will find is that folks, uh, the, the root of the uh, 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 resistance of restoring voting rights, right, is based on how you think people will vote, right? And 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 there was a misconception here in Florida, uh, and you know I can understand why, because felon disenfranchisement, when you look at its history, its purpose, its it, its original intent was to strip the newly freed slaves of the right to vote, right? Uh, but like any tumor left unchecked it's going to spread throughout the rest of the body. And so now you, we had more people who could not vote in the state of Florida that looked like you than those that looked like me, right? Mm -hmm. And so it became an all-American, uh, it really did become an all-American issue. Um, and, and so when you see, when we ran across arguments about it, it was people who was assuming, number one, that um, it's, it's an African-American issue, Number two, it involves people who are incarcerated. And number three, that African-Americans generally vote for Democrats, right? So, those, so those you will have Democrats myths. that's for it. You will have Republicans that will be against it, right? But then when you talk to people individually about people who they love, let me tell you, it's some very core values or principles that we live by. You can search far and wide and you would be hard pressed to find anyone who would raise their hand and say, you know what, Kim, I don't ever want to be forgiven for anything that I've done for the rest of my life. Right. Mm -hmm. You're not going to find that all, all of our systems, this, this nation is, is a nation of second chances. Our system tells us, right. Even like when you pay your last mortgage payment, you're not expecting another bill the following month. Right. And if another bill comes, you're going to like, well, what the heck is this? right? You pay your last car note. And even those who file bankruptcy are given the second chance, right? That's the purpose of bankruptcy. So this is a nation of second chances. We do believe in forgiveness. We do believe in the underdog. But what happens is that when you let uh, uh, politics seep its, 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 its ugly hand into that issue, it clouds it and it distorts it. And it creates a, a, a chasm between left and right and and neighbor and family member. And what we did was we circumvented that or neutralized that by going straight to the heart. So you went person to person, person to person and had this conversation. Person to person, 50,000 miles a year. Just think about that. 
For how many years, Desmond? For at least three straight years, I did. I, I put those miles on my car. So I'm wondering again with your background, and is there something about? It looks like you went through a lot of hard stuff to get to that point. Uh, some people would feel pretty knocked down. You obviously got up and fought pretty hard. Is there something about your your background that gave you the strength? to do what you just described, to drive those yep. 50,000 miles. Well, what is that? Well, what is well, that? That's why I wrote my book, right? My first book, Let My People Vote. Right. Um, I hope folks have opportunity to get that. Um, but I, I put that in my book because here's the deal. The, the very same things that knocked me down, the very same things that caused me to lose my self-esteem, uh, to devalue my life are the very same things right, that have caused me to do the work that I'm doing now, you know, and we, there is a very, for me, a simple formula for taking the negative things in your life and turning them into positive things, right, uh, I wrote my book because I needed folks to know, right, and I tell you, one of the things was I, I, I had a conversation with Time Magazine when I attended the ball, and I told them that they made a huge mistake, because they put the rock, on the cover of that edition of Time. And I told them that they should have put me on the cover, right? And, 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 and the reason why I told them that, because folks need to know, right, that you don't have to be a movie star. Yeah. You don't have to be an athlete. You don't have to be a politician or a rich person or a famous person to have an impact in your community, in your state, or even the world, right? But this one thing that you got to have. You've got to have something within your heart, a genuine a desire within your heart to want to make the world a better place. And if you commit yourself to giving back to your community, to serving your community, one thing, uh, what, what I tell the people, uh, I tell folks, is that one of my definitions I use for love is wanting for your neighbor what you want for yourself, right? And so when I go to bed at night and I pray that God would give me the strength and stamina and the wisdom to do his work, right? I prayed for you, Kim. I didn't, years before I even met you or even knew your name, I prayed for you because I loved you, right? And I loved you because I recognized the humanity in you, right? And if you have that type of mindset, if you don't need the fame, you don't need the money, you don't need the celebrity status to impact people's lives. So you mentioned earlier, in response to my question, you said it's the same things that were so hard, the really rough valleys of your life that give you the strength to do what you do now and what you've done so tremendously over the past few years. Can you give an example, if you're comfortable, of, gosh, that was a rough day or, you know, I, I don't know how I got up the next day? I mean, what's, <laughs> what, was, what is one of the, whoa, gosh, I'm glad that's over in your life of all the many challenges that it looks like you've been through? Let me give you a, a, a glimpse into one of the roughest times in my life. I was addicted to drugs. I called a friend to get some money so I could get some more drugs. And my friend told me, I don't have money, but I know this woman pastor that if you would go to her and ask her to pray for you, your life will improve. And when he told me that, something came over me and said, maybe this is my ticket, right? Maybe this I, would actually pull me out of the grips of addiction. And when I looked at my pockets, all I had was enough money for a one-way bus ticket to the other part of town, right? I didn't even have enough money to transfer to get another bus. And so I went as far as I could go, and then I walked the rest of the way to this church. And, and as it happened, that the church was starting service. And I remember going in there and sitting down, and I stayed the whole service. After the end of the service, I approached the pastor, and I said, listen, I am homeless. I am a drug addict, right? And I, you know, I don't, but I don't want anything from you. I don't, I'm not asking for money, clothes, or food. A friend of mine told me if I can get to you and have you pray for me, I'll be all right. Pastor, would you, would you please pray for me? I was just that desperate. And I never forget that she put her hands on my shoulder and she pointed at another gentleman in the church and she said, you see that man over there? And I was like, yes, ma'am. She said, go to him and have him make an appointment for you for tomorrow. And in my head, I'm like, woman, do you understand how desperate I am? 
that I don't even know how I'm going to get back to where I was. And I came here off of faith. I, I'm, I'm, I just, I just need prayer. Something that don't take but a few seconds. And you're telling me I have to wait till tomorrow. And I remember when I didn't even go to the man, when I walked away from her, I walked out of the church. And as I was walking out, I remember thinking, man, even God has turned his back on me. Wow. And that I didn't night, think that, yeah. That I night didn't think you'd end the story night. that way. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I didn't think, I thought you'd say, and she saw, she showed me the light, but she didn't. No. She, you felt abandoned in that moment. That was, so, so that was I'm the lowest. The, so I'm on the edge of my seat. How did, how did you not go, go lower? How did you go higher? I, but I tried to, because that night was the first time ever. Now, I've been homeless for several years right? That was the first time ever that I slept on a bus bench, right? When I was previously homeless, maybe I would sleep in an abandoned building or somewhere behind, maybe behind the dumpster or whatever, so people won't see me. But that night, I slept on a bus bench right there in front of a busy thoroughfare, and I didn't care who saw me. And the next morning when I woke up, I tried to uh, go to a treatment center check myself in but the irony of it is that in order for you to check yourself in the treatment you can't have drugs in your system like if i could stop long enough to clean my system i don't need you guys right obviously i'm coming to you because i'm desperate they turned me down and that was when i was walking somewhere else and as i was uh, i seen railroad tracks ahead and as i was approaching the railroad tracks my mind went back to a story I read in the papers a couple weeks prior about a gentleman that committed suicide by train. And when I got, I got fixated on that story. And when I got to the train tracks, I stopped. I could not move. And I stood there and I was waiting on that train to come. You know, and while I was waiting, I'm thinking, okay, am I going to die instantly? Or how much pain I'm going to feel when this train runs across my body and severs me or whatever? I don't know. Right. And I'm thinking about all this stuff, but I could not move. And I waited and I waited and I waited. I was ready. I was ready to go to end it all. But the train didn't come. And it, it was so strange because the tracks that I stood in front of was the train tracks that led trains to the port of Miami, which is one of the busiest ports on, on in the east coast of, of the United States. Right. And train normally runs mm -hmm. right quite often. But that day. When I was there, it didn't. And I ended up crossing those tracks, and I walked a couple blocks further to another drug treatment uh, a clearinghouse, and I was able to get in the treatment. So that was some, some experience of grace, I would say. Uh, yeah. Something that really um, carried you through. How, you know, we have, um, uh, you know, millions of Americans that are addicted to, to, to various kinds of drugs. Um, and you know, you've moved mountains in Florida it, with, with voting rights. Do you have ideas on an, an issue like that? How, I mean, you, you were left by, you were abandoned by that, at that, that church. How, how do, how to bring more people to where you were to find that inner strength? Do you have any views on that, Desmond? Well, I mean, I could think in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, not personally, um, not from an individual perspective, from, but from a more broader community-based perspective. Um, number one is how do we shift that narrative, right? That narrative that separates us as human beings, right? And that separation normally occurs through the use of labels, right? Just like using the, the term felon or ex-felon, right? And using that, uh, basically what you're doing is that you're dehumanizing me and you're desensitizing yourself towards the plight of people uh, uh, um, who have uh, had run-ins with the law, right? But at the end of the day, you know, how much different am I than you, right? I'm someone's son, someone's father, a brother, you know? Um, and, and so what I believe is that if we can shift that narrative, right, then there's a much, uh, 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 a much humane approach right, that, that we're not going to criminalize poverty, right? We're not going to uh, 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 marginalize people 
because they don't make as much money as someone else or because they have the different skin tones as someone else does, right? Even our churches, right? That, that narrative that causes our churches to look down on people with felony conviction. Now, here's the, and here's the irony of it, right? That, you know, for a time, the church was the last place that a person like me would want to go because that's the one place where we felt the most shame, mm-hmm. right? I get that. I get that. You yeah. get that, right? But yeah, Catholic, I was raised it. Catholic. I get it. Yeah. But, but let me show you the irony. One of the most revered uh, 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 figures in Christianity is Paul. Right, Saint either Saint Saint Paul, right? But before he was Paul, his name was Saul. And the type of atrocities that he committed, if he were to do it today, we would be screaming that he'd be buried underneath the prison. Yeah. Right. But yet, this is the same guy that God chose, and that Christians now like honor and and and, 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 and give great respect to. Moses murdered someone, hmm. right? When right. you look at it, David murdered, had someone murdered, right? right? Because he was having an affair, right? So you have, you know, within our faith, whether it's Christianity or Judaism or even Islam, you have characters who basically for all intents and purposes are returning citizens. They right. are people who, who run afoul of the law, right? right? And so the church should be the last place to make someone mm-hmm. feel that way because they honor and reverence people just like me. Right. And there's a lot in the Bible, but, of course, yep. about redemption and forgiveness. Yep. And, you know, yep. Mary Magdalene was also, she was shunned as a sinner and the lepers, Jesus, Jesus yep. treated all of those things. And we lose those messages. I think yep. I have to ask you, given what's happened this week, um, and, you know, you talk about that label felon, which I, I agree is, it feels alien to people and it is alienating and and uh, and sort of glosses over all the aspects of humanity of each mm-hmm. human being. But we now have, you know, we Americans have seen a, a former police officer who now has three felony convictions on his record, a white police officer uh, for mm-hmm. murdering a black man in Minneapolis. How do you process that, Desmond, when, you know, you hear all kinds of people from the president to Nancy Pelosi to you know, all kinds of people weighing in on this. How does Desmond Mead process that? You know, and some of that stuff are, to me is empty words, right? Or even misguided words, because at the end of the day, they're still per- perpetuating a narrative that creates conditions like that, right? Uh, in which a person could put their knee on the neck of someone and, and, and hear them crying for help and would have their hands in their pocket and look around nonchalantly right, would actually take a person's life on camera and not even bat an eye about it, right? Uh, um, and so that's that same narrative, Kim. And excuse me for using you as an uh, yeah. a, 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 a so, example, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm trying to drive home a point. It was the same narrative that at one point said that you are nothing but the property of other people, right? Which narrative? Which you know, narrative that, are that you That narrative that told you that you couldn't even vote that you were the property of someone else. That narrative, right? This no, I mean, it's very respect to Chauvin. But, What's the narrative that you're pushing that's what I'm, The narrative that some people's lives are not as valuable as others, right? The narrative, and it, it's, it's, it's part of that same, that same flow that basically says, it's okay if you don't make enough money because you're a woman, right? <laughs> it's okay if the police officer is rough with this guy because he has a record, right? Or it's okay because he was dangerous. It's okay because he resisted. And the, the, the narrative doesn't ring true for everybody else, right? That process doesn't ring true for everyone else. And so we know that it's a narrative that creates an othering, right? To say, oh, it's those other people, right? It's not us, right? That's well, you went the to law school. You went to law school late in life, um, which is amazing. Uh, and I say that just because I, because I'm a law professor and I have people of all different ages, and that that's courageous in and of itself because it's a it's a uh, your first year, as you can attest to, is pretty tough. But I say so, you know, and I'm sure you believe in um, you know a, a solid defense. How did you feel then about Eric Nelson's focus on? 
uh, Mr. Floyd's history of, you know, addiction to painkillers or whatever. I don't even know what the what the, the substance was. Yeah, well, you know, there is a con isn't there a, 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 um, uh, I, I want to say concept because I can't think of the better word uh, in, in, in torts about the eggshell theory, right? Right, the eggshell plaintiff, right. yeah. There you go. So even if a person had pre-existing conditions, right, that doesn't excuse your negligence, right? right? That's number one, all right? Number two is, is that if you notice every time, especially if there's an African-American man that was brutalized or murdered by the police officers, one of the very first things people do is point to their record, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, they had a previous run-in. It's amazing. There's a new show called, uh, a new documentary called Racially Charged that talks about that most of the killings that we've seen, the, the person that was murdered by the police officer at the, at the very most was guilty of a misdemeanor. Yeah. Not even a felony, right? right? They're and, not even that, dangerous, yeah. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. at, so that, you know, the fact that they did something wrong or the fact that they may have had a past, that does not negate, right, the value of their lives, right? So I, I'm not less valuable because I was convicted of a felony. That's why I can't vote. That's why I can't get housing. That's why I can't go to school. You know, or born into poverty, say? right? Born into yes. poverty, leaves a tiny little baby with no no control over their circumstances. Um, yeah. So so on the the Chauvin situation, I'm wondering, um, do you feel there was some relief or something to celebrate in the fact that? those defenses didn't carry the day in this particular case. I think this is the first police officer in Minnesota that was convicted of murdering. Um, I mean, I, again, do you Well, think you celebrate, if you want, if, if I'm going to celebrate anything, what I'm going to celebrate is that that family was able to get what they wanted, right? And that what they wanted was this person to be held accountable, right, for what he did to their loved ones. I would celebrate that, right? But when I look at in its totality, you know, <laughs> I mean, I guess, you know, when you think about that, it should have been thousands of these cases already, right? Uh, I was looking at a graphic earlier today saying so far in 2021, there's only been three days in which a police officer did not shoot and kill someone. That's unbelievable. Three days, and we're in April, right? And so there is nothing to celebrate as long as there's still this narrative, this underlying narrative that makes it okay or creates conditions in which people are scared of each other, right? right. And therefore would act unreasonably, right? Well, well um, we also talked off air before we started the show about uh, understanding the law a little bit. I did a piece for The Hill a couple weeks or maybe a week or so ago on because I've been talking to people who watched what, what George Floyd's actions were and said, well, he, he did this wrong, he did that wrong, he should have done this, he should have done that, and then we have other stories. Yeah. And so I said, okay, I'm just going to do a piece that says, these are the fourth, these are your rights with respect to police. Um, yeah. and, and what do you say to that in terms of education? Only a third of Americans <laughs> can name the three branches of government. Only 66% even voted in the last election. How, what's your response to the lack of information about rights listen, and civics in America? Listen, and, and let me let me just say this first, right? That it's nothing wrong with being ignorant, right? We're all ignorant to certain things, right? There's something wrong with you being stupid, right? We're not ignorant, right? And when you don't know, right, a, what a wise person do is try to find out, right? There is so much that we don't know. And the more that we learn, the better we're able to navigate this world of ours, right? That you cannot have, our ignorance will cause us to have an electrical problem in our home and we complain with the, to the plumber, right? That's what our ignorance will have us do. Our ignorance would have us direct anger in, 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 in uh, at least all of our anger in the wrong places. Right. One that I, I was listening to the mayor uh, of um, I can't remember the city in Ohio, 
which is where the young lady was just shot and killed by the police. Columbus, but he I said think, something that made so much sense and, and things that I've been talking about for quite a number of years, that you've got to look at the collective bargaining agreements, right? You've got to understand, oh, if you understand the dot matrix chart of aggression, if you understand the trainings that police officers uh, go through, right? And then you understand the dynamic of, of, of our society, right? And, 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 and some of these statutes that protects the police officers, then we, we must, if we understand it, then we know we must direct some of our anger towards these policies and these statutes and we get people to change those things, right? It's, it's very easy to be anger, anger uh, to be angry at the police chief, right? But in a, in a lot of cases, the police chief hands are tied, right? Because, they, oh, you got to fire that guy. There have been so many cases, uh, and, and the, the mayor talked about it, where, yeah, the police officer got fired, but because of the collective bargaining agreement, right. they had to rehire that person right. and give them back pay. Right. That's an excellent point. Yeah. And, well, and, and, and so even with getting statements from officers after a police involved shooting, there are some uh, 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 um, municipalities that are limited in, in access to that police officer. Some may take as long as 72 hours before investigators can even question that officer, which gives him time to get with his people and try to get the story together. Yeah. Well, and at the state level, I have another piece actually coming out tomorrow in the Hill that talks about sheriffs. And I want to segue it a little bit to voting because over, you know, 3,000 sheriff's uh, positions are actually elected in this country. Uh, so you want, I mean, that's not your police chief that's appointed uh, by the mayor or other city <laughs> officials, mm -hmm. but there are sheriffs and constables. And not only are they elected, um, they tend to be reelected for years and years and years because it's just us, you know, it's just people are comfortable with it. They don't think about it. They, they can get the job with zero, zero expertise, zero experience in law enforcement, and they have tremendous authority over prisons, yep. over transporting prisoners, over declaring causes of death. So yep. my question to you, Desmond, is, and this is something that really bothers me. So it's really like person to person I'm asking mm -hmm. this. How do you persuade people who have the right to vote, the 1.4 million, and, all, and many other millions, the 40, the 40 mm -hmm. million that don't, how do you get them to treat this right as important as you and I know it is? How do you get them to treat it like, gosh, this by, is- By this having is those good. conversations, Kim. By having those conversations, you got to understand our system is to blame because where is the money spent, right? Where is the attention spent? Where are the ads? They're all geared towards presidential elections, yeah. right? When you look at the amount of money, it's, it's just insane or the resources that are poured into presidential elections. But even, and even as we're doing that, here we are saying, but local elections are more impactful. But it doesn't manifest it through the amount of resources that are dedicated for midterm elections, right, and local elections. And so, therefore, you don't have people talking to people about the importance of state attorneys or DAs, the importance of sheriffs. In, in Florida, the uh, uh, criminal court judges are elected as well, right? And so you don't have a, a ton of resources right. poured into that. And that's why you would have a person that's elected as judge because nobody knew to run or nobody, you know, uh, 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 oppose someone or, or, you know, maybe they, when they get elected, it's off a few votes because it's not important. Everybody's looking at the top of the ticket, right? But our conversations is that we got to start from the bottom up, right? Right, that, right. Oh, and those a lot of these people that impact us the most. The a most. lot of these, they run unopposed as well. Yep. So it's not, you know, people aren't even thinking about it yep. um, and they run unopposed. I, I want to get, I mean, I'm really taken with uh, your passion and description around this concept of shared humanity and this idea that when we understand each other and we speak human being to human being, we see through the noise of politics. And so I'm gonna ask something very candid of you. And I know that you're, well, well, you're willi willing to answer these questions. And that is for someone who, who looks different from you, could you explain what is it like to be black in America? <laughs> That, I, I mean, that's, that's a big a question. 
No, it's you know, not. I really it, mean, like, how do you is. speak? How do you speak I, to a white person and say, "Listen, th this is what we're like. This is how we're the same." And I know this sounds, I don't well, know, hyperbolic or something, but we're in a moment right now around race, and yeah. I want to give you that opportunity. You know, um, that's that's a very interesting question. Let me answer it by saying this. You know, I remember when I was riding around the state of Florida, there were certain counties uh, in 2016 when I'm riding around, there were certain counties which before I entered that county, I would stop on the side of the road. I would go in my trunk and I would take something out of my trunk and put it in the back seat of my car, right? Just in case I get stopped by the police, I could roll all the windows down. And when they walk up to my car with their guns drawn, they could see what I put in my back seat. You know what it was I put in my back seat? No yeah. one has ever guessed. I put a campaign sign for Donald Trump oh, in my wow. back seat and hoping that when the police officers see that sign, they would think that maybe I'm one of those good Negroes and maybe I make it home alive. Right? That's the reality of my existence, right? That you have to put something in your back seat to hopefully diffuse a potential situation in which you could lose your life. That's yeah. my reality. So it's right? it's it's and, fear. It's, and, and I mean you're a strong and, person, obviously, but but fear has a lot of effects on the mind, on the body, on on so much about your life to live and, that and, way. And I think what folks have to understand, you know, one thing I learned in recovery is that uh, they teach you that if you've been using drugs for ten years, right, just because you have a month or two clean. Right? Don't get too happy with yourself. Right? If you want to think you got a good handle on it, get 10 years of clean time. Right? Get the same amount of clean time as you had when you were using drugs. Are you with me on this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, let me throw this at, so let me throw this at you. This country has been engaged in slavery for over 400 years. Yeah. It's been less than that. Right? We have existed after at the end of since the end of slavery it is way less than 400 years right we haven't even gotten to a point to where this country's involvement in slavery is something of a very distant past no it this lives in our recent. consciousness yeah and you're talking about 400 years that's four generations upon generations upon generation upon generations that believe that people who looked like me were dangerous, was not even a complete man, right? Did not have the capacity uh, 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 to do amazing things, uh, didn't have the intelligence, right? And, 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 and should not be read. And it was okay to brutalize me and treat me, my wife, my kids, any way that they wanted to. And I dare not uh, 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 talk back. I dare not be loud. I dare not resist or I right. would die, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I dare not even try to vote or I would die, right? And so we're not too far removed from that era. Well, and, and we it wasn't to... until 1965 where there was serious access to the ballot and that was ruined in 2013 by the Supreme Court. Okay. And now we're seeing, so, so, so I mean, been maybe we only had yet, a right? tiny, it hasn't even, it hasn't even 100 years. We had it hasn't been years. 100 years. So we that 100 years. years that we've lived, Kim, d does not even make a dent in no. the 400 years of slavery, right, that, 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 that black folks had to endure in this country. And, 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 and guess what? And that also means that, that less that 100 years, not even 100 years, right, of white people's mentality toward oh, black people is not even enough to negate the mentality that white people had about black folks for 400 years. Right, and I mean, in my message to my friends, I don't think I've ever said this publicly, but for a white person to a white person, is don't pretend that it doesn't affect you too. Yeah. It affects all of us. And we all, yes, it does. We, we all were, were raised in this environment. It affects all of us. And I say it not in a good way. And so we have to be mindful of it and acknowledge it. Um, are you worried about, are you worried about Voting rights um, moving forward, given you know the, the, the Texas bill. I mean, 
what do you think is going to happen? I mean, when I, when I say worried, of course, you're always worried. This is your life's work. But are you really worried? I mean, are, yeah. should we be extra of worried Of course, now? everybody should be worried. Democrats, Republicans, this thing to me is beyond, it be, it's beyond, it's bigger than voter suppression. What's right? the it? It is what's a blatant it? attack against democracy. What's the no it? Period. The insurrection? Are you talking about the What's the no, it? No, I'm talking about what we're seeing in, in, in about 48 different states, right? legislation uh, 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 that seeks to limit access to the ballot box, right? Uh, uh, in, here in Florida, we had legislation that was just signed into law that it, it was like really an insult because it now uh, seeks to criminalize peaceful protests, yeah. right? Oh, Ohio uh, does that too, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and so now what we're seeing are, uh, is a handful of politicians that is eroding democracy. And in the process of doing that, what they're doing is that they're limiting who gets to vote and also punishing people for speaking out against it. For a first Just think matter. about that. That mm -hmm. is a blatant attack against democracy, a blatant attack. And it should scare anybody, whether they're conservative, whether they're progressive, independent, it should scare the bejesus out of everyone because once that is stripped away, it is open season for anyone. Right. Then we're all the same, right? In terms we're of all. Uh, government's not going to pass you over because you've got a Trump sign in your backseat. I mean, it, and that's just, you know, it doesn't, uh, everything's gone. And, yep. and people don't understand this. This is not our birthright. This is not, this is not for keeps American democracy. Uh, and it, it was flawed to begin with. And we've worked towards getting it better. Um, but I, I'm with you, Desmond. I'm, I'm very, very worried. Um, do you think now, do you think HR1 should pass in its, in its current form? Do you think it will? And so for our viewers, that's a massive <laughs> voting reform package that's passed the House of Representatives. But to get through the Senate, they would have to either get rid of the filibuster or adjust it tremendously or do it as a matter of a appropriations bill. But well, where, 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 Listen, where's the light? Wait. Where's the light in the darkness for you? Is it that? You know, let me thing? tell you, it, I definitely don't hold too much faith in politicians. I, yeah. <laughs> it's this anything kind of could happen. Uh, if anything, I'm going to have faith in people, right? Uh, regular, everyday, you no know, red-blooded Americans uh, to stand up against this and push back and take matters into their own hands. Um, we did that with Amendment Four. Uh, it was a people's campaign grassroots all the way through and through. And we were able to accomplish something that seemed impossible. And so I know that the impossible is possible. I know that when you look at impossible, what I see is I am possible. I'm possible, right? We're possible if we can connect along the lines of humanity and lead with love. So what's the people have asked in the chat, first of all, how can they help your organization? And second of all, what I want to ask, what's your, what's the, takeaway that people can do today, tomorrow, the next day uh, to make an impact in the way that we're talking about? You respond to suppression with aggression. And what that means is that anytime that you have a handful of politicians that want to strip away the right to vote or strip away access to the ballot box, then what you do is respond in kind by registering even more people and turning even more people out to vote. Right. And, and then making sure that who we're electing in the office are public servants, not politicians. We need more public servants. And maybe step one could be if you're watching this conversation or you see it online afterwards, share it with one, two, three people. Share and then it. they share it with one, two, three people. And then they share it with one, two people. Because it sounds like what I'm hearing is you need human to human contact. You've got to have My, my my soul or heart to yours, my my humanity to your humanity. Uh, that that that's what it's going to take. Yeah. Well, yeah. Definitely, and so folks, um, they could definitely um, if they definitely want to support the work that we're doing. Uh, we know that the Florida legislature uh, created these barriers that now require people to pay outstanding fines and fees before they're able to register to vote. Last year, we raised over twenty seven million dollars and was able to pay off the fines and fees of over 44,000 returning citizens. We're still doing that. People can go to our website at www.floridarrc.com. That's Florida, ours and Romeo, ours and Romeo, 
www.seasoncat.com uh, to find out ways that they can donate to help the cause, our fines and fees program, or just to give us general support so we can continue to register people to vote, engage and empower returning citizens, and, and create a more inclusive democracy. Here and what about, you mentioned also earlier, you mentioned sports teams, corporations. Yep. Is there something people can do to put influence on and those, or, those Listen, constituencies? You get them to speak out against voter suppression. Get them to stand for democracy, right? That's, I'm, I'm here right now in my car outside of the Amway Arena where the Magic and the Pelicans are, are, are playing a game. And I'm trying to get the players to wear the Let My People Vote shirts right, to make a stand, uh, to get these organizations that are coached by some amazing coaches and uh, Coach Stan Van Gundy and Coach Steve Clifford, uh, who understands this, to just be a, a, a megaphone for the work that's going on on the ground. And so if, you know, right, the message your, your teams and your these corporations and say, if you want our dollars, then we need you to want democracy for us. Right. Pick, email, right? It doesn't even take that yeah. much. Do it an really email doesn't. a day, tell a friend a day. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, Desmond, it's really, truly been a privilege to talk to you. And I want to thank you for your time. It's been really amazing. Well, thank you so much for having me, Kim. I, I really enjoyed the time we spent on your IG, right? And look <laughs> forward to doing it again. For sure. For sure. Best All of right. luck to you. Enjoy the game and go back to your beautiful five children. Thank yes. you again. <laughs> this is <laughs> Simple Politics. Have a great one. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Good All night. Right. Bye now. Bye-bye.